Hey everyone, this is Dr. Hathcock, and with this topic, uh, the labor movement, we're going to start looking at re reactions to the Industrial Revolution. Um, your last uh, video that you would have watched uh, would have covered industrialization uh, and all of that. And so with the labor movement, we're looking at the people who worked for uh, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Morgan, and guys like that. Uh, so this labor movement is about uh, worker complaints, factory worker complaints. Uh, during the industrial age. Okay, so the effect of industry on labor. Uh, number one, you have to admit that there were more jobs being created. Um, now, again, that you have that tidal wave of immigration coming in from Europe as well as from Asia. So it's like there were more jobs, but job creation wasn't keeping up with uh, the pace of immigration coming into the country. Uh, but you have to uh, admit that there were more jobs being created as a result of the industrial revolution. Now, as you'll see here in a minute, a lot of times these jobs were very exploited <clears throat> with all kinds of unsafe conditions and long hours and wages. Uh, but you have to say that there were more jobs being created. <clears throat> Another mindset or uh, effect of all this is sort of what happened to the mindset of workers over time. Uh, now, truth be told, when workers got a job, uh, you know, they talked about how the first feeling was just simply one of of relief, like uh, they would be able to work, they would be able to make money, they would be able to provide for their families, if you will. Uh, so at first it was sort of a sense of relief, uh, happiness, uh, you know, the ability to earn a living. <clears throat> but over time, what happened to a lot of the these workers uh, is their mindsets began to change. Uh, they began to realize very quickly how exploited they really were. Uh, that they were working long hours uh, for very low wages. Uh, that a lot of times the conditions that they worked in were were not very good. Uh, yeah, OSHA would have had a field day uh, with a lot of the conditions that were going on uh, in the latter part of the 1800s. So they began to understand that they truly were being exploited. Uh, with that understanding, it, uh, their mindset became one of anger, one of frustration. Uh, they wanted better pay. They didn't want to work as many hours as they were working. Uh, they were tired of being uh, taken advantage of like they had been. And that frustration really, in, for many anyway, it gave its way over to an anger, over to a, a rage. Uh, you started to see the formation of labor unions uh, to fight back. Uh, people uh, joined up with all kinds of different uh, organizations uh, like anarchists, uh, socialism became a big push in the latter part of the 1800s as well. And really their focus was to fight for uh, better hours, better pay, better work conditions, and things like that. So the effect of industry on labor in the mindset of workers was, uh, at first there was sort of a sense of relief, uh, I guess a type of joy in having a, the ability to earn a living. Uh, but then that very quickly gave way to a frustration uh, being so heavily exploited, uh, which then also gave way to this rage uh, that plays out in these various fights <clears throat> for things like the eight-hour work day, uh, the minimum wage, uh, on and on it goes. <clears throat> there was also a feeling uh, as, in looking at mindset of workers. Uh, there was kind of a feeling that, you know, they just didn't understand everything that was going on all around them. I mean, this industrial revolution changed everything. And they just didn't understand how they fit into the bigger scheme of things. Um, you know, a lot of them later on, when you get into like uh, an assembly line, would talk about how they just felt like a robot, like a machine, uh, you know, just pull a lever all day sort of a thing. So there's confusion within that mindset as well. Uh, they said that they really never kind of uh, met their boss, you know, that there was a sort of this impersonal thing where it was just, uh, you know, somebody's name on a paycheck, but you never actually knew your boss or talked directly to them or anything like that. Uh, so that's part of the mindset as well, that confusion, frustration, anger. Okay, but in looking at the exploitation of uh, workers uh, in the early industrial age, let's start by looking at long hours. Uh, generally speaking, people work 12 hours a day uh, they tended to work six days a week, 
And the only reason they got Sundays off is because the Bible uh, basically said, you know, you rest on the Sabbath. Uh, if the Bible hadn't said that, they probably would have worked them seven days a week, truth be told. Uh, but yeah, 12 hours a day, six days a week was the standard. It was really the norm. Uh, and you think about some of those people like, uh, you know, I mentioned previously the guys who worked for Carnegie and those steel mills, just how hot that could be, uh, just how grueling, uh, you know, a grind that job could be. Uh, to do that day in, day out, 12 hours a day, six days a week, uh, it's just beyond me that they were able to do that. Uh, you had those, uh, a lot of these uh, factories were what we, we would call sweatshops in today's world where everybody sort of packed in together real tight. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of room for moving around and things like that. Uh, that's that's quite a crazy life. Uh, people talked about how, you know, they would uh, walk off to work as the sun was coming up. Uh, and they would start walking home at the end of the uh, work day as the sun was going down. Uh, so they didn't really get to get outside and enjoy things that much. Uh, they really talked about how their life was one of wake up, scarf down breakfast, go to work, you know, grab something to eat for lunch during work, uh, walk home tired, scarf something down for dinner, fall asleep, wake up and just do it all over again. Uh, they didn't really have time to relax, to do what they want to do, to, I don't know, raise their kids right, you know, love on them, talk to them at the end of the day. Uh, they really were like robots in many ways. Just wake up, eat, go to work, uh, walk home, eat, go to sleep, and just do it all over again. So yeah, 12 hour days, six days a week. Uh, really low wages. Uh, these people were paid a fraction of what they were truly worth. Uh, the vast majority of the American workforce in the latter part of the 1800s, and even on into the early 1900s, uh, was living below the poverty line. Uh, it was constantly, most of their check money was going to rent, uh, going to food. I guess things haven't changed much uh, in the last 150 years, it seems. Uh, that's what we spend a lot of our money on in today's world as well. But uh, yeah, long hours with very low wages, uh, people living below the poverty line, and all of this was just the norm. It was standard, if you will. Uh, layoffs happened frequently. Uh, they happened without any type of warning. Uh, and it wasn't that, you know, you did anything wrong, uh, but a lot of times these uh, these owners of factories would just lay people off uh, so that they could increase their profits. Um, a lot of times, you know, when they would play these monopoly games where, you know, um, like a Rockefeller, for example, is trying to take over uh, the oil market in an area, <clears throat> he would lay people off without any type of warning uh, just to get revenue back up. Uh, then, you know, buy out that whole region, uh, take over the, that whole market. Uh, and like I said, then we, he would lower his prices drastically. Uh, but people would lose their jobs because of those various takeover games uh, that the, uh, the factory owners of the time were playing. So, yeah, layoffs were frequent with no warning. And to be laid off, I mean, there wasn't like a government at that moment that's going to step in and provides you with some sort of unemployment benefits. Uh, there's not really a social security at that time. Uh, to be laid off is, I mean, at that point you're you're begging uh, churches for any type of help. Uh, you're standing in soup lines, uh, you know, to try to get a meal. Uh, yeah, layoffs were frequent without any type of warning. Like it was not unheard of for someone to have like 20 plus jobs in a lifetime back then. Just bouncing around from factory to factory to factory looking for work. Okay, the working conditions were not very good at all, and that's uh, being nice. <clears throat> you know, safety just wasn't something that was on people's minds at that time. Uh, and, and a lot of these uh, owners of businesses would say, well, okay, so I could hire a janitor to clean things up, but that eats into profits. You know, that's uh, that eats into the bottom line. So they really didn't feel this need to have safety standards or safety regulations or anything like that. You know, there's this horrible story of the Triangle Waste Shirt Factory, uh, this horrible accident that happened in New York City uh, in March of 1911. Uh, it's this, uh, it's a place that made shirts, basically. Uh, it's shirts that would go down to about your waist. So Triangle Waste Shirt. 
This is kind of the name of the business. Triangle Waste Shirt Factory is where these uh, people were working. Uh, but yeah, in March of 1911, a, a fire broke out uh, there at the Triangle Waste Shirt Factory. Uh, let's see, uh, the escape routes, the way to get out of the building, uh, there weren't that many available because, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the owners of the factory often kept the uh, the stairways locked to prevent theft. Uh, the owner of the uh, the factory itself, he didn't like the fact that uh, a lot of his workers would go off to smoke cigarettes, uh, that they would be idling sort of out in the hallways, so he would lock doors, uh, you know, lock exit ways and things like that to keep people in the factory itself to keep them working. Uh, most of the workers there, uh, they tended to be young girls, about 12 years old, uh, teenage girls. Uh, a lot of them were Italian. A lot of them were immigrants who had just arrived to the United States. So, yeah, uh, locking doors uh, to keep people inside, to keep them working, to keep them from getting up and walking around and smoking cigarettes and, you know, just doing anything other than uh, working for the bottom line. Uh, so that when the fire broke out there in March of 1911, uh, you have all these girls at the top floor of the building. They're trying to get out. Uh, they're trying to open doors, but they're locked. Uh, they're trying to use stairways, but those are locked as well. Uh, when they tried to use the fire escapes, uh, those, uh, those sort of uh, iron uh, stairwells built outside of windows. Uh, so you get on those and you start to slowly but surely uh, climb down. You know, some of the girls got on those uh, stairwells and were starting to climb down. Uh, but there had never really been what you would call a city inspector who would come around to make sure that fire escapes were working, uh, you know, to make sure that this thing was uh, properly latched. And after uh, quite a few of the girls had gotten onto the fire escapes, uh, it began to give way, shake, uh, it broke free of the building, uh, and it comes tumbling down to the streets of New York. Uh, instantly killing some of the girls there. Uh, people on the streets in New York stopped to watch in horror as, you know, smoke was coming out of the top of the building. Uh, they could hear the screams of young girls who were uh, being burned alive. At some point, some of the girls, rather than be burned alive, they tried to jump out the window and, <clears throat> you know, they come crashing down to the streets of New York, uh, dying on impact. Uh, but when it's all said and done, there was something like 150 uh, girls that burned to death, uh, that were burned alive in the Triangle Way shirt uh, factory fire. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, when the, uh, when the city of New York investigated and looked into it, uh, they found that if the doors had simply been unlocked, <clears throat> if this, you know, the stairwell doors and the doors in the, the building itself had been unlocked, that the vast majority of these young girls would have survived. So, you know, that's the kind of conditions these, these people are working in. Safety is not a thought. What if a fire breaks out is not a thought. And uh, as horrible as Triangle Way Shirt Factory was, and it, it's a horrible thing, uh, I guess if there is a silver lining to it, uh, like all across the United States, uh, cities, states, municipalities, uh, they started to pass safety regulations and safety codes. Uh, they started to hire on someone who could go out and actually inspect buildings and make sure that they were up to standards and codes. So it's really sad that it took those girls burning alive uh, to wake America up to the fact that it needed some safety standards. Uh, but, you know, before trying a waste shirt factory, and again, that's 1911, just imagine the conditions before that, like from the 1860s and 70s, 80s, 90s and on, uh, <clears throat> where people who owned businesses just, they did not feel compelled. Uh, to provide safe working conditions uh, for their workers. Uh, here you can see some photographs from the Triangle Way Shirt Factory fire. Uh, yeah, the uh, the building that's in the picture where all the uh, water is being poured towards uh, or uh, shot towards, uh, it's the top floors of that building where the fire broke out and, and those girls were trapped and burned alive. <clears throat> here you can see on the right-hand side all the caskets lined up. As again, most of those girls were just like 12, 13 years old. Uh, most of them were uh, immigrants who had just arrived from uh, Italy as well. Okay, the next point, the impact of rising labor numbers. So as you had more people coming into the United States from Europe, 
from Asia. Uh, I would say also as you had more people leaving, say, farms and moving into cities, uh, the impact of rising labor numbers is the situation got worse before it got better. Uh, the people who own businesses felt like they could just simply take advantage of people as they pleased. Um, you know, if, if you dare complained about anything, if you said, hey, I'm tired of working 12 hours a day, uh, I'm tired of such little pay, they just fire you. You know, there, there wasn't any need to, to negotiate or haggle or talk with somebody <clears throat> who was complaining. Uh, you just fire people. Uh, because, you know, there's like a hundred people lined up outside the door who are starving, begging, looking for work. We'd be more than happy to take that job. So as more and more people arrive in the United States, you get this labor pool that's just very big. And factory owners realized that they could pay people whatever they wanted, work them for as long as they wanted, uh, keep the conditions uh, as bad as they wanted. Uh, because if anyone dare complained, they, you could just fire them and replace them like that. So in that world, what a lot of American workers realized is that as an individual, they probably didn't have much of a fight to change things. I mean, like if just one person goes to their boss and says, hey, you're working us too hard, eh, that person's going to get fired. Uh, but then uh, the workers of America began to ask questions like, well, what if we unite together as a group? Uh, what if instead of one of us going to the boss and saying, hey, we're working too much, what if uh, I don't know, 200 of us go to the boss and say, hey, uh, we want better hours here. You stood a better chance of possibly getting some change. <clears throat> now, truth be told, at first, <clears throat> factory owners just simply fired 200 people. Like, no kidding. Uh, they weren't going to be told what to do. They weren't going to negotiate with their labor force. Uh, you know, even if 200 came, with, came to them and said, hey, we need better conditions in this factory, uh, they just fired 200 people for real. But there was a sense, there was a feeling that if everyone came together collectively as a group, uh, you could probably bargain better for hours and wages and things like that. So that's really where the rise of the labor unions comes from. Uh, it's this desire to change hours, wages, conditions, uh, really just to kind of fight for the rights of factory workers uh, in the United States. Uh, so you really start to see the rise of these labor unions in and late 1860s, definitely there in the 1870s, uh, major forces in the 1880s going on. Okay, so in looking at labor unions, um, <clears throat> I want to talk about problems that they could control. We'll call those inherent problems. Uh, then we'll look at problems that they could not control. We'll call, we'll call those outside problems. But let's look at problems that were inherent with the labor union. Uh, and these are things that they... Uh, in, in many ways, they could control these inherent problems. Uh, no particular order here, but inherent problem number one to look at uh, was, uh, <clears throat> like, who was going to lead this thing? You needed a good leader. Uh, whoever was going to lead a labor union, that person was going to have to be thick-skinned. They were going to have to be tough. Uh, that person was going to be uh, cussed at, spat upon. Uh, physical violence against them. Uh, they really were going to be seen as sort of the uh, the enemy of the factory owners. So you had to have someone who was tough, uh, thick-skinned, while at the same time was charismatic, could lead, could speak, could organize. Uh, and, you know, it's often hard to find all of that in one person. Uh, tough as nails, you know, can take a fight, uh, but is also charismatic, compassionate, uh, able to lead, able to organize. Uh, those really are pretty hard things to find. Um, okay, another inherent problem uh, was whether or not to be political, whether or not to get involved in politics. Uh, you know, some of these uh, labor unions got heavily wrapped up in the politics. Uh, they got involved in socialist movements. Uh, they got involved in sometimes anarchic, ar anarchy movements. And a lot of these labor unions just started screaming, you know, death to America, death to capitalism. And that <clears throat> that wasn't really a fight that was going to be effective uh, at that period of time. So whether or not to be involved in politics uh, was a big question as well. Uh, and last not least is uh, membership and a question of who you were going to allow into your labor union. 
Uh, you could just build an army of people. Just if they work, who cares? Let them in. Uh, or you could try to be a little more selective in your membership. Uh, maybe let people in who have some type of certification or degrees, uh, electricians, for example, or people who are carpenters, you know, somebody who has like a specific skill set. So those are some of the inherent problems associated with a labor union. Uh, leadership, uh, politics or not, and membership. Now I can tell you that the labor unions that went on to succeed, <clears throat> the ones that sort of uh, leave a lasting impact, uh, they had a strong leader. Uh, they tended to stay away from politics. They just stuck to what we call bread and butter. Uh, bread and butter is just, you know, wages, hours. Don't get affiliated with politics and all that. Uh, they steered clear of politics and their membership ten tended to be uh, more select, uh, you know, just go with the specific skill set. Don't just, you know, let anybody into the union as you please. Uh, so the best labor unions, the ones that worked anyway, for their inherent problems, they chose a strong leader, stayed out of politics, and had selective membership. Okay, outside problems are things that they really couldn't control. Uh, outside problem number one really is the United States government. Uh, the U.S. government at that time was uh, very laissez-faire, and it didn't matter if it was Democrats or Republicans. Uh, they both were laissez-faire when it came to, to workers' rights anyway. Uh, but you might remember from the last lecture, I talked about how both parties professed to be laissez-faire. I told you the Democrats meant it, like the Democrats were 100% laissez-faire. They weren't going to help the rich. They weren't going to help the poor. Uh, they really felt like the government's job was just to stay out of the way. Now, the Republican Party of the time, it professed to be laissez-faire, but it was only half laissez-faire. Uh, Republicans would not help the poor. They would not help the working class. Uh, but they did help, uh, you know, factory owners, banks, the rich, the railroads, things like that. <clears throat> so whether it was Democrats or Republicans, neither political party uh, really was going to fight for uh the labor unions or, I don't know, eight-hour work days or minimum wages or anything like that. Okay, um, so the United States government, its makeup, its laissez-faire policies, uh, that's outside problem number one. Uh, outside problem number two is that Americans just don't like strikes. Uh, Americans have a fear of strikes, if you will. <clears throat> you know, um, Americans just don't like it when things get slowed down. Uh, you know, when we when we order things uh, in today's world, we order things online. Uh, we want it here like yesterday. Uh, you know, we don't want to hear about a strike or this happened. And that's why my product hasn't arrived yet. Uh, you know, when strikes happen, things get uh, slowed down. Uh, you know, flights get canceled. You, you see what's happening with the, uh, the airline industry lately in today's world. Uh, flights get canceled, you know, uh, and people don't get to uh, go on their trips. So strikes, um, although in today's world, that's got more to do with, uh, I don't know, supply, uh, supply chain issues uh, than it is going on strike. Uh, but Americans have always feared strikes. Uh, to give you sort of an 1800, late 1800s analogy, uh, you know, there was a big railroad strike in Chicago uh, in the 1870s. And like when that strike happened, it, it shut the country down. Everything going from the East Coast to the West Coast flew through Chicago, uh, the trains that is. Stuff from the West Coast to the East Coast, it all went through Chicago as well. So when those train workers in Chicago went on, went on strike, uh, there were trains for miles and miles and miles outside of Chicago. Uh, they just couldn't get through because of the railroad strike. And, you know, the number one complaint of Americans when it happened, uh, their complaint wasn't, um, <clears throat> there, it wasn't, you know, uh, oh, those poor railroad workers, I hope they get better pay. Uh, oh, those poor railroad workers, it's sad what they're, they're dealing with. The complaint of Americans was, hey, I ordered a dress from Sears Roebuck like two weeks ago. Why the heck hasn't my dress, my product, what, my whatever it is, arrived? So Americans were very upset about that railroad strike, but they were upset because they weren't getting their products, <clears throat> the goods that they had ordered on time. 
Um, you know, eventually uh, the army was sent in. Eventually the, the strike was put down. Uh, and then the train started rolling again, and Americans were happy again uh, because they got their stuff. They got their products. Uh, but the strike that I use as an example uh, in looking at strikes uh, is what happened in 1892 at the uh, Homestead Steel Mill. Let me go ahead and put up this uh, picture here. Uh, this is uh, the Homestead Steel Mill. Uh, it's in Homestead, Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm sorry, Homestead, Pennsylvania, uh, which is not far from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, but this is a steel mill that's owned by Andrew Carnegie. You can see the big smokestacks in the back. Um, you can see the river there to its side. Uh, this factory is owned by Andrew Carnegie. Uh, but the... Uh, I guess you could say the right-hand man of Mr. Carnegie uh, is this fellow you see here, Mr. Henry Clay Frick. Uh, Henry Clay Frick was the plant manager, like he handled its day-to-day -day affairs. Uh, and by all accounts, Henry Clay Frick was very anti-union. Uh, he boasted and bragged about how anti-union he was. Uh, whereas Carnegie maybe was seen as the good cop, uh, Henry Clay Frick, no doubt about it, was the bad cop. Uh, Henry Clay Frick, in many ways, was a pretty unscrupulous man. Uh, he had been involved in some very shady uh, business ventures in the past. Uh, but here he is in 1892. He's the, uh, he runs the day-to-day -day operations of the Homestead Steel Mill. Uh, and in 1892, uh, Frick uh, was essentially going to uh, try to put pressure on the workers there uh, to take uh, uh, to take wage cuts. Uh, at that moment in time, they were going to start working the factory workers uh, more hours to try to increase productivity. They were going to increase their hours, while at the same time decreasing the, their hourly rate. So the workers there at the Homestead Steel Mill said, you know, you're out of your mind, you're crazy. Uh, you know, working us more hours, but then giving us less uh, wages per hour. Uh, why would we do that? Why would we agree to those terms? So there were these negotiations that were taking place uh, there in 1892 between Frick, the workers, uh, through their union. Uh, but uh, in the midst of all that, Andrew Carnegie decided to take a vacation. Um, he decided to go back to uh, his homeland of Scotland uh, on the pretext of going hunting. And he just sort of left everything in the hands of Henry Clay Frick to the side. Which, by the way, Carnegie knew exactly what he was doing. He didn't want to mess with this. Uh, he just wanted Frick to, to deal with the problem. Carnegie knew it was going to get ugly. Uh, he knew that uh, Frick, the, the way he was, he was going to deal with this with an iron fist. And really, if anyone could have kept this from getting out of hand, it was Andrew Carnegie. But rather than sort of stick around and try to negotiate this in a good way, uh, Carnegie just leaves. You know, he just goes off to Scotland and leaves it all into Frick's hands. Uh, but at the end of the day, Frick, uh, in June of 1892, uh, he essentially shut down the plant. Uh, he shut down the steel mill, uh, tells all the workers to go home. Uh, you know, if they won't accept what he's offering, which is lower wages, <clears throat> then he'll just replace them with uh, new workers. Uh, Frick put up a fence around the entire plant, the, the entire steel mill. Uh, they called it Fort Frick. Uh, this, uh, you know, this chain link fence sort of thing that he put up around the entire steel mill operation. Uh, the workers would every day show up, picket, uh, line the fences, uh, essentially formed a human wall around the thing. Uh, labor union activists got involved as well and came to Homestead to help out uh, the workers in their strike and their picketing and everything. Uh, Frick tried to hire replacements. Uh, these people would have been called scabs. Uh, but every time these replacement workers came to the steel mill uh, to try to get in, uh, you know, they, they were ridiculed, they were spat upon, they were in some instances beaten uh, and essentially made to run for their lives. Uh, those, those workers that there at the steel mill weren't going to let those scabs get through. So Frick, in trying to figure out what to do, um, you know, contacts local law enforcement. You can just imagine uh, the local sheriff coming out. And, and seeing like 400 plus people uh, there striking. And Frick's like, you know, these people are on private property, arrest them, get them off of private property. 
And, you know, lo local law enforcement is just shrugging its shoulders like, yeah, okay, I, I don't have enough handcuffs, uh, much less enough space in the jail for this. Uh, so, yeah, this is beyond local law enforcement. So Frick then decided to hire uh, a group of people called Pinkertons, uh, Pinkerton Guards, the Pinkerton Agency, if you will. Uh, these were ex-military types. Uh, most of the Pinkerton guys uh, had been in the Civil War. Uh, they were good with guns and things like that. <clears throat> you know, Pinkertons were hired to uh, ride on trains to protect valuables that were traveling by train. Uh, every once in a while before there was a Secret Service, uh, Pinkertons would be hired to protect presidents when they traveled and things like that. So I don't know. The Pinkertons were military types who you could hire uh, for various jobs. Uh, okay, so the Pinkertons... Uh, when they uh, come to Homestead Steel Mill, uh, they use the river that you see there uh, in our little uh, picture. It's all cloak and dagger like, you know, they, they came up the river at uh, the break of dawn. It was still dark. The sun wasn't quite up yet. Uh, what the Pinkertons didn't know is that the, the uh, workers had spies all over the city. Uh, they had little kids like uh, out there on that bridge that you see. And these little kids were told, hey, look, if anything suspicious happens, just blow your whistle. Even if it's a false alarm, it's okay, you know, just blow your whistle. So there are these uh, boats uh, coming up the river in darkness with all their lights out. Uh, the kids can see on the boats there are guys that have guns. So, yeah, they start blowing their whistles really loud. Uh, others start blowing their whistles, too. Before you know it, there's a whole group of people down there along the banks of the river. Uh, waiting for the Pinkertons to uh, to land, try to uh, strike. You know, they were going to come in and hit them in the flank, real military style and all that. So the Pinkertons, before the boats even uh, land there along the side of the river, uh, the workers start to throw rocks. Uh, they start to throw various items at them. Uh, I don't know if, if you know what a Molotov cocktail is. Uh, it actually got its name during World War II. But a Molotov cocktail is where you take a bottle of, of flammable liquid uh, you sort of dip a rag in the flammable liquid, then you light the rag on fire. Uh, you throw the bottle with the rag at whatever your target is, and when it hits, it breaks, and the, the flammable liquid goes everywhere and starts a big fire. So they're getting hit with uh, Molotov cocktails. Their boats are on fire. They're getting hit with uh, rocks. Uh, some of the Pinkertons uh, do manage to fire their guns back at the workers. Uh, and so a firefight breaks out uh, there along the banks of the river. Uh, this firefight lasts something like uh, 11 hours. Uh, when it's all said uh, and done, uh, seven workers are killed, uh, four of the Pinkertons are killed. And, you know, there were like all these people there along the uh, shores of the river just screaming, kill the Pinkertons, kill the Pinkertons. Uh, but when the, uh, the battle was uh, over with, the Pinkertons surrendered. <clears throat> excuse me, to the factory workers, <clears throat> and they were marched away. So at that point, Henry Clay Frick didn't quite know what to do. Local law enforcement can't handle this. Um, you know, the Pinkerton guards are overwhelmed by the striking workers. Uh, so he sent a telegram to uh, boss man back in Scotland, uh, Carnegie, and explained, you know, I've done this, I've done that, I'm not sure what the next steps uh, are what I'm going to do. Uh, so Andrew Carnegie in Scotland, when he receives the telegram, uh, he tells you, Frick, you know, hang on, wait. Um, and then Andrew Carnegie sends his own telegram uh, to the governor of Pennsylvania. Now, the governor of Pennsylvania, in receiving that telegram, uh, I promise you he knows who Andrew Carnegie is. Uh, the governor of Pennsylvania relies on Andrew Carnegie for money for support, uh, for votes. And Carnegie's telegram to the governor of Pennsylvania essentially is, you know, hey, uh, my wife and I really enjoyed your campaign finance dinner that you held last year. Uh, you know, the wife particularly liked the white wine. Uh, looking forward to this uh, upcoming year's uh, campaign finance dinner as well. Uh, period, end of that paragraph. Next paragraph. Uh, my man Henry Clay Frick is having some troubles at our homestead steel mill. I wonder if you'd be so kind as to call out the Pennsylvania National Guard uh, and assist my man Frick. So the governor, in reading that telegram, understands uh, 
you like that money? Uh, you like that money I gave you last year? I'm going to give you some more money this year. Uh, but a lot of that is contingent upon you sending in the Pennsylvania National Guard and helping out my man Frick. So the governor of Pennsylvania knew who buttered his bread. Uh, he knew that you don't trifle with people like Andrew Carnegie. So, yes, the governor of Pennsylvania sent in the National Guard. Uh, some 4,000 strong, the Pennsylvania National Guard shows up at the gates of the Homestead Steel Mill. Um, at that point, the, uh, the workers realized there wasn't much more they could do. Uh, the Pennsylvania National Guard comes in uh, ready to fire, ready to fight. Uh, but the strike is put down at that point. Uh, at least the factory itself is opened up anyway uh, for the scabs to come in. You know, the uh, workers there at the Homestead Steel Mill, the strikers, they continue to protest. They continue to fight for months. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it didn't matter. Once the, Nash, the Pennsylvania National Guard opened the factory back up, uh, Frick wasn't going to uh, negotiate with them anymore. Uh, but, you know, along the way, uh, you know, there were some things that happened as afterwards, uh, some things that had bearing on all of it as well. Um, so there was this, uh, this young man, he was from Lithuania. Uh, he was an anarchist who was very sympathetic uh, to, uh, to the union, or I'm sorry, to the striking workers. Uh, his last name was Berkman. <clears throat> and this anarchist named Berkman, uh, he took a job in the factory uh, pretending to be a scab worker, just a guy who was coming in. Uh, but Berkman sort of bided his time and waited for his moment. And one day there on the uh, factory floor, uh, Carnegie came walking by, uh, was walking up to his office, which was sort of an upstairs office. Um, this Berkman guy follows Frick, uh, follows him up the stairs. And as Frick is walking into his office, uh, the young man yells his name. Uh, and he shoots uh, Frick right in the neck, like twice uh, Frick got shot in the neck. Uh, then the, the kid stabbed him three more times in the neck. <clears throat> you can just imagine like blood flying, people stunned, screaming, yelling uh, as shots have been fired and things like that. Uh, and, you know, Frick, even though he's been shot and stabbed in the neck, uh, he managed to punch the kid right in the face, uh, dragged him down to the ground and was like repeatedly punching this young man uh, before people showed up to drag him off of his would-be assassin. Uh, amazingly, Frick survived. He had these huge scars on his neck for the rest of his life. Uh, but you want to talk about one tough dude. Uh, these would-be assassin bullets and stabs to the neck didn't take the guy out. Um, you know, with that, it, it's crazy. Like, all across America, people read about this would-be assassination of Henry Clay Frick. And like there was sympathy for Frick and people said, you know, what a madman, what a lunatic to try to kill someone like that. And it really hurt the cause of the strikers. Like Americans didn't have any sympathy for them because they're just seen as a bunch of lunatics, uh, crazy anarchists who shoot people and try to kill them and things like that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, most of the, of the striking workers were uh, blacklisted. Uh, that's where the people in a region get together and they, they, they literally have like these books with the names of people you should not hire so that when someone was hiring new factory workers, they'd say, hey, let me see the blacklist. And if your name was on the blacklist, they wouldn't hire you for a job. So, yeah, a lot of these people who worked at Homestead, like they didn't find work in the Pittsburgh area. They had to move to other states. They had to go somewhere else like Ohio, for example, uh, to look for work. So <clears throat> this Homestead Steel Mill, this whole scene, uh, what it shows you is uh, the owners of factories are not sympathetic uh, to the plight, to the fight, to the cause of these laborers. It also in many ways shows you that the American people are not sympathetic to them, that the American people see what's happening as anarchy, murder, arsons, assassins, crazies are the ones who are at the root, the heart of these uh these strikes and these labor unions. But I, I think the most telling thing of all and what Homestead shows us is how how you deal with strikes at that time. Really, the the way you handle them is uh, the person who owns the factory, the, the money man, if you will, contacts a politician. 
uh, a politician who is behooven to this person. They gave them money, they gave them support, they gave them something. A uh, politician sends in military, and we don't have a strike anymore. And that's how strikes were handled forever and a day. Uh, was a uh, businessman contacts politician, politician sends an army, army in strike. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, no negotiations, really, no uh, caving into demands for hours and wages. <clears throat> just if they won't accept what you're offering, just send in the military, and we don't have a strike anymore. Okay, so now in looking at um, national labor attempts, uh, we're going to look at a couple of these uh, labor unions. Um, <clears throat> and looking at them, I guess kind of keep in mind the problems that we talked about previously, like problems that are inherent, uh, problems that are outside of their control. And the first group to look at is a group known as the Knights of Labor. Uh, the Knights of Labor really were the first like national big um, labor union in the United States of America. Now, these lights, Knights of Labor uh, were formed in Philadelphia, and rather than it being like, say, one strong leader in charge of the whole group, uh, it was actually a group of men. Uh, it was a group of about 12 guys uh, who, quote, were in charge of the Knights of Labor. So that's one thing. They didn't go with like a strong leader. They went with a group of men. Uh, to lead them. Uh, the Knights of Labor got heavily involved in politics, uh, some, sometimes often very crazy politics, like uh, anarchists and people like that, bomb throwers. Um, you know, they were they would get into politics. It was anti-capitalism, uh, anti the United States of America. Uh, as far as membership, they would let just about anybody into the ranks. Uh, of their organization. Uh, if you worked, if you toiled for a living, as they put it, uh, they'd let you come in. Uh, now, there were specific people that the Knights of Labor would not allow into their union. Uh, they specifically said that they didn't want uh, doctors, uh, lawyers, financiers, uh, which is a way of saying bankers, uh, or gamblers in the ranks of their uh, their union. Uh, they said that those people in particular, doctors, lawyers, bankers, gamblers, uh, they called them blood-sucking pariah upon the American people. Uh, and they did not want them within their ranks. And if you just take a, a moment to think about it, so doctors are educated, they tend to have some money. <clears throat> that could help your, <clears throat> excuse me, my goodness, that could help your uh, fight. Uh, lawyers, they understand law, legal standing. They probably could argue really well for you in court cases to come. <clears throat> uh, bankers, last I checked, they have money. Uh, that could help your cause as well. Uh, gamblers, um, yeah, I don't know. but I mean, they've got money, but they're, <laughs> they're pretty shady. I don't blame them for that, <clears throat> for keeping them out. Uh, but yeah, some of these people that they kept out of their ranks really could have helped them along the way. Uh, some ways in which the Knights of Labor were kind of progressive, uh, women were allowed into their organization. <clears throat> that wasn't true of all the labor unions at that time. Uh, and they also allowed African Americans uh, as members in their unions as well. Uh, really what the Knights of Labor wanted more than anything was just numbers. Like they wanted an army. <clears throat> they wanted a lot of support, a lot of dues being paid because uh, they saw numbers as power. So they were not selective in their membership. They did get involved in politics. And it wasn't really a strong leader. It was more of a group of men uh, who made decisions for them. Uh, now, as far as what they were fighting for, and this is true of the Knights of Labor, it'll be true of uh, the American Federation of Labor as well. Uh, in fact, what any labor union at its core was fighting for, uh, I've always called it the labor fight. Uh, you can put whatever you want in your notes, the labor fight, the labor movement. Uh, but essentially what they're fighting for are the, these primary goals. Uh, in no particular order here, but <clears throat> they were fighting for an eight-hour workday. <clears throat> uh, they believed that all you could ask of a worker was eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, and eight hours of leisure. 
That is to say, that's what a person should be asked of <clears throat> each and every day. Uh, eight hours of work in their job, eight hours of sleep, and then eight hours just to feel like a human, spend time with your kids, uh, do something that you enjoy, that you can get some meaning out of life with. So yeah, that was the uh, the motto for the eight hour work day. Eight hours work, eight hours sleep, eight hours of leisure. So they were fighting far, hard for an eight hour work day. Uh, they were also fighting for what they would have called the minimum standard, uh, but what we today call the minimum wage. That if you work for a living in the country, you should at the very least be paid this much, uh, this minimum, this standard uh, of living, if you will. So they were fighting for a minimum wage. Uh, let's see, they were fighting for uh, safer work conditions. Uh, that if people showed up for work, they shouldn't be terrified of being in an accident. Uh, you know, a fire breaks out and they die. Uh, an arm gets caught in machinery and is mangled and they're, you know, they can't use it for the rest of their life. Uh, so they're also fighting for things like that. Uh, and one other thing they were fighting for was uh, uh, no child labor. Uh, child labor laws, if you will. Uh, that children should not be working in factories. Uh, it's crazy back then, man, in America, we had five-year-olds working in factories. Uh, we sent eight-year-old kids down into coal mine operations uh, where they would just get all that nasty stuff in their lungs and die in their 30s from, uh, uh, you know, lung complications. Uh, we had little kids working in cotton factories, uh, textile factories, I should say, um, you know, working around machinery, like, I don't know if you've been around a five-year-old for an extended period of time, but they're just full of energy. And God bless them. They've got to play. They've got to run. They need to play tag and hide and seek and things like that just to run around and have fun and be a kid. So you can just imagine a factory floor where people are trying to get some work done. <clears throat> and you got five-year-olds running around playing tag, you know, uh, running into some guy and knocking him off into a machine and somebody gets hurt. So, yeah, there really was no place for kids in factories then, now, ever. Uh, but, you know. Yeah, you had little ones working uh, in factories back in the day. And here's this crazy idea that the uh, unions were fighting for. It said, hey, how about if the five-year-olds go to kindergarten, right? How, if we, how about if we have the kids go to school? And that opens up jobs for 25-year-olds and 35-year-olds uh, that maybe uh, need that money to put some food on the table. So, yeah, they were fighting for child labor laws as well. Uh, the kids should not be working in factories. And today's world, we get all worked up when we hear about sweatshops in China uh, and other parts of the world. Uh, and I always tell students, you know, hey, I, and I agree with you, it's bad that there are sweatshops in the world. Uh, but we had sweatshops right here in the United States. We had little kids uh, making shoes right here in the United States back in the day, 1860s, 1870s, uh, heck, on into the 1910s. <clears throat> so, yeah, in today's world, when you hear about kids over in China uh, putting in Put them in sweatshops and they make nikes and shoes and stuff that is horrible and those children should not be treated that way uh but we did the exact same thing to kids right here in the united states uh like 100 150 years ago okay so that's basically the labor fight what all these unions are fighting for the eight hour work day uh the minimum wage uh safer work conditions uh child labor laws and uh, I would also put into uh, safer work conditions. I'm sorry, I, I should have put it uh, earlier. <clears throat> they, were, they were also fighting for workers' compensation uh, or workers' comp. Uh, that is to say that if you get hurt in an industrial accident, uh, <clears throat> who you work for should pay your medical expenses. Uh, they should pay for all your bills to get you back up on your feet and working again. Uh, so they're also looking for workers' compensation if anyone should get hurt. Okay, well, these Knights of Labor at first, they really seemed like they were the organization fighting for change. Uh, it had quite a bit, uh, quite a, a few members within its ranks. Uh, it was like the organization that people were going to uh, when it came for, to uh, representation and things like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, a big problem that the Knights of Labor eventually would run into uh, is the fact that they became synonymous with anarchy. Uh, they became synonymous with, uh, I don't know, uh, stabbings, bombings, things like that. And in 1886, uh, you have this big thing called the Haymarket Riot that breaks out in Chicago. 
Uh, it happens on May the 4th, 1886. There's this scene in Chicago where uh, some people who work for uh, the McCormick Harvesting Company, uh, it was based in the Haymarket District of Chicago. Uh, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> the McCormick Harvesting Company uh, had laid off uh, some of its workers. Uh, said workers were going on strike, kind of like Homestead, uh, if you will, that we talked about before. Uh, but something like 40,000 Chicago workers uh, went on strike as a show of solidarity uh, to those who worked at McCormick. Uh, this actually happened on May the 3rd, the day before. Uh, you know, you got these 40,000 Chicagoans taken to the street. Uh, some violent clashes break out between uh, strikers and scab workers. Uh, you know, police show up, they fire shots into the crowd. Uh, two people get killed. So it, it really does infuriate uh, the labor union leaders there in Chicago. So they call for another big meeting on May the 4th, uh, the next night, to discuss the situation. Uh, big rallies held, a lot of people show up. Uh, it really actually was a peaceful uh, meeting from, for the most part. <clears throat> but anytime someone got up to speak, the, the speeches that were given that night on May the 4th, they were very uh, anti-factory, uh, anti-capitalism, anti-United States. Uh, each time another labor uh, leader got up to speak, they're denouncing America, you know, they're, they're, they're fighting against capitalism and things like that. Uh, so at some point, uh, the Chicago Police Department shows up. Uh, they're there to disperse the crowd. And, you know, there's already tension left from the night before uh, as the Chicago police show up. Uh, but they start to walk into the crowd and they're, they've got their billy clubs drawn. And they're saying, you know, uh, it's time to disperse, go home, this is over. Disperse, go home, this is over. Uh, and as the Chicago police are starting to march into the ranks of the crowd, uh, somebody in that crowd threw a homemade bomb right into the ranks of the police department. Uh, we don't know who threw that bomb. Even all these many years later, we still don't know who threw that bomb. Uh, but yeah, somebody had a homemade device uh, that they lit. Uh, they, you know, let the fuse go down. They throw it into the ranks of the police. Uh, when it goes off, uh, instantly, several police officers are killed. A dozen more are wounded. And as the smoke sort of clears from the bomb going off, uh, you know, the cops are pretty upset. Uh, some of their uh, fellow policemen are down, hurt, dead. Uh, and Chicago's finest decided to pull out their pistols. And they started sh uh, shooting into the ranks of the crowd. Uh, they shot in the general direction of where they saw the bomb flying at them from. And uh, it's just a pure chaos, riot, breakout there at the Haymarket there uh, that night. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the hospitals were so full of injured. Uh, there's not really an accurate count as to how many people were injured, how, uh, ultimately how many people died. Uh, but, you know, dozens, uh, dozens are wounded and killed, uh, many, many more. Uh, end up in the Chicago hospitals. Like the Chicago hospitals were just full of people with uh, broken bones, lacerations, you know, all kinds of bodily harm. Uh, but in the aftermath of the Haymarket riot, <clears throat> the uh, the leaders of Chicago wanted answers. Uh, really, in a sense, the entire country wanted answers. Like the American people wanted to know who was responsible for murdering the police, uh, who was responsible for the chaos that broke out in the streets. And most of the labor leaders who got up and spoke that night uh, were members of the Knights of Labor. Now, that doesn't mean that the Knights of Labor threw a bomb at the, at the police. That doesn't mean that at all. But, I don't know, the media was looking for an answer. The people of America were looking for an answer. So uh, they pin what happened in the Haymarket on the Knights of Labor because they say they instigated this. They were the ones who got that crowd stoked up and angry. Uh, they're the ones who called for the violence. So the Knights of Labor just become synonymous with cop killers, uh, people who throw bombs into crowds, uh, you know, anarchists, uh, knife wielders, things like that. So yeah, that's what happens to the Knights of Labor is they become synonymous with anarchy and violence. Uh, they lost a lot of membership, the Knights of Labor did, after the Haymarket riot. A lot of people just stopped paying their dues and kind of didn't want to have anything to do with the organization anymore. 
because uh, you can imagine like you're some factory worker back in the day uh, and you know you you want better hours and better wages and things like that so maybe you pay your dues to this organization thinking well they're the biggest one out there they're they're the ones most likely to bring about the change but then you start to read about how they're violent they're associated with killing cops they're associated with throwing bombs and you really don't need all that you know you're you're just average joe trying to bring home uh money to your family and you don't need to be associated or you don't want to be associated with anarchists violence crazies and things like that so it was the unraveling of the knights of labor uh this incident that happened here in the haymarket riot uh and it's also one more incident that shows that the american people don't like strikes uh, the American people don't like these organizations that are seen as violent, crazy, uh, killing people, anti-American, anti-capitalism, things like that. Okay, so that the next organization to look at is uh, the American Federation of Labor. Uh, it's often also just simply called the AFL. Uh, but this organization took a different approach uh, to trying to uh, fight for these labor unions. Now its goals uh, are the goals that I mentioned earlier, the labor fight, uh, the eight hour work day, the minimum wage, <clears throat> safer work conditions, workers comp, uh, child labor laws and things like that. Uh, but this organization is gonna go about it uh, almost in a completely different way uh, from what the Knights of Labor had done. Uh, a lot of that is attributed to its leader, Mr. Samuel Gompers. Uh, Gompers uh, was a guy who grew up on the uh, streets of New York uh, he himself admitted he was in gangs uh, growing up in New York. Uh, he felt it was, a, you know, just the best way to survive. Uh, but at some point, he, uh, well, to go back to his being in, in the, growing up on the tough streets of New York. So he was a fighter. He had thick skin. Uh, you know, he, he was a tough guy, if you will. I uh, wasn't afraid of a fight, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but, you know, Gompers eventually got a job in a uh, cigar making company. Uh, kind of rises through the ranks of said cigar making company uh, and shows intelligence, aptitude, uh, forms a union of cigar makers there in New York City uh, to fight for hours and wages and things like that. Uh, but eventually, Mr. Gompers is put in charge of the American Federation of Labor. Uh, in the late 1880s, when it's being formed, he'll be uh, the really the one and only president that they'll have. Uh, till he passes away many years later in the 1930s. <clears throat> so Samuel Gompers is the guy who's going to lead the AFL going forward. Uh, so I guess there you have point number one. They have a strong leader who's thick skinned, tough, uh, but is also charismatic, compassionate, can organize, can lead, uh, things like that. Uh, Gompers made sure that the AFL steered clear to politics. Uh, they're just going to fight for hours and wages. They're just going to fight for bread and butter, if you will. They're not going to get heavily involved in politics. They're definitely not going to get involved in sort of radical movements that are trying to overthrow the U.S. government. Uh, you know, Gompers would often say that he loved America. He loved the possibilities of America. He also would say things like he, he understood capitalism and he thought it was a good system. Uh, but his fight was for what was right in that <clears throat> workers were not being given their just pay uh, for their hard work. So he's pro-America, he's uh, pro-capitalism, but he also feels like workers are being taken advantage of and they should be given a living wage is what he's fighting for. So they steer clear of politics. Having said that, it was not uncommon for the AFL to endorse a political candidate like, you know, they might put out an ad in the newspaper a few days before election, say, hey, uh, we here at the AFL, uh, we strongly support a uh, candidate for Mayor X, whoever that might be. You know, they could come out and endorse a candidate for office, but to like be heavily involved in politics and to just be out there campaigning big time, they weren't doing that. They weren't going down that road. Let's <clears throat> see, last not least, as far as looking at membership, they were very selective in their membership at first. Uh, they just wanted carpenters and skilled workers, electricians, people who had certifications or degrees. Uh, so they wanted, I guess you could say, a more select group of people, uh, at first anyway, as members uh, within their ranks. 
All right, so Gompers in the AFL, what they fought for, or what he said was, you know, you just have to build upon each success. Uh, you just fight, fight, fight to win one thing, one little building block. Uh, then once you get that building block, you fight, fight, fight for another thing. Hopefully you get that. There's another building block. But he was very clear that they would fight within the system, uh, that they would not call for the uh, the death of America or the overthrow of capitalism or anything like that. Uh, in fact, he hated uh, strikes. He said that going on strike should be the very last resort. Uh, oftentimes he talked about how embarrassing things like the Haymarket riot were, uh, that when things like that got out of control, it was just embarrassing for the entire labor movement and what they were trying to accomplish. So I guess what you could say of the AFL is they took a much more conservative, uh, many would argue a much more realistic approach to their problem. You know, Gompers knew that this labor fight was going to last forever, uh, that there would always be this tension between those who work and those who pay for work, uh, that business and labor would always fight. Uh, he said, you know, these fights will continue on long after I'm dead and gone. Uh, and he's right. We still have labor fights, even in today's world. We still fight over uh, living standards and living wages. So he understood that you fight within the system. Uh, you don't scream death to America. You don't you don't try to overthrow the system. Uh, you work within it for change over time. And look, it's going to be a long fight. There's even going to be setbacks along the way. Uh, but he believed in the cause of labor. Uh, he believed that it was a lifetime struggle for him and that it would be a struggle for generations to come as well. Uh, and looking at membership numbers, I, I used to go in depth on this, but I don't anymore. Uh, just, you know, uh, up to, say, 1914, uh, Gompers in the AFL were really selected who they would let into their group, their membership, if you will. Uh, but then in 1914, they sort of just opened it up to anyone, <clears throat> anyone who works in the country for a living uh, could be members of the AFL. Uh, and there's a stat that by by the end of World War I, so say 1919, somewhere in there, uh, by that time, 80% of the American workforce that was in a labor union, I did not say 80% of the American workforce. What I said was 80% of the American workforce that was in a union were members of the AFL. So that tells us that by uh, the end of the 1910s, the AFL is the organization that uh, factory workers are turning to uh, for change, for answers, for hours and wages and things like that. Uh, that 80 percent of those in a labor union were members of the American Federation of Labor. So really, we as a society, uh, those of us who toil for a living anyway, uh, we owe Mr. Gompers a great deal of debt. Uh, I mean, it's guys like this who fought for eight hour work days and minimum wages and things like that. Uh, you know, it's crazy, but in our country, there were actual wars being waged for the eight-hour workday, for the minimum wage and workers' comp and, and all those things. Uh, there were literally wars being waged 115, 120, 150 years ago uh, to get kids that were six, seven years old in school uh, and not working in factories. So, yeah, it's it's got a lot to do with how society is formed today and uh, the world that you live in today. Uh, well, rounding out this topic and looking at the plight of late 19th century U.S. workers, uh, this really was an uphill battle. Uh, with lots of setbacks, there were uh, people who died for minimum wage and eight hours and things like that. But the plight of late 19th century U.S. workers really was an uphill battle. Uh, there's this moment in 1914 where uh, Woodrow Wilson is president of the United States. And he wants to know, he's basically asking his advisors, uh, you know, these people who go on strike, these workers who are so upset, do they have a legitimate uh, complaint? Like, you know, people don't just wake up in the morning. Well, most people don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, you know, let's go strike. Let's go break windows and let's go get into fights. You know, most people don't want to do that. So for people to risk their lives and go on strike and go through all this hardship, it, are they legitimate in their complaint? So uh, the U.S. government, through uh, Woodrow Wilson and his advisors, did a, uh, a bit of a case study 
on uh, what was the plight of American workers, like what was the workforce facing. And when the uh, report came back, it shocked Woodrow Wilson. Uh, it shocked his advisors, too. Uh, but what they found was that in 1914, more than half of America's workforce was living below the poverty line. Uh, that is to say that more of the more than half of the people who worked in our country, uh, they couldn't pay their basic bills like rent. They couldn't pay for food. Uh, their basic things, they just could not uh, cover those costs. So that's shocking that if somebody's going to work 12 hours a day, six days a week, that they can't even pay their mortgage or their rent. Uh, they can barely put food on the table for their kids. So the answer that the government got from its report was, Yes, absolutely. These people do have a legitimate complaint. Uh, they do have a right to be upset. And you start to see under the Wilson administration a push for uh, child labor laws. Uh, it's under Woodrow Wilson that we'll get the first labor laws uh, to get kids out of factories. And just a side note to that, like, so they raised the working age to 12. So that would be raised later on uh, in things to come. But when we first established child labor laws in our country, it said that you had to be at least 12 years old uh, to work in a uh, work uh, in a factory. Uh, they also established workers' compensation uh, under Woodrow Wilson. It started with government workers, but then it uh, it uh, it went on to uh, the workforce period. So Woodrow Wilson in that progressive age, you start to see these movements for uh, some of those labor complaints to be addressed. Uh, but it'll take even years after Woodrow Wilson, many more decades to get a minimum wage, uh, an eight hour work day and things like that. So these people did have a complaint. And that's 1914. Uh, you know, you can just imagine what it was back in the 1870s. Uh, how many more people must have been living under the poverty line back then? Uh, in spite of that realization, uh, business management continued to fight uh, against any change whatsoever. Uh, those who own businesses just believed that if you cave in on any fight, you'll be seen as weak and they'll think that they can get anything they want. So like if your workers come to you and they're complaining about uh, low wages and you give them a pay raise, then they'll think, OK, well, this person's a sucker. They're weak. So uh, now let's hit them for the eight hour work day. And, you know, they're a sucker. They're weak. All we have to do is fight hard and they'll cave on the second point as well. So for a lot of business owners in America, the solution was just don't give in at all. Uh, don't give them an inch and they can't take a mile. So yeah, they fought back hard uh, through that way, just stonewall their workers, don't listen to them, don't negotiate at all. Uh, business management fought back by uh, you know paying for politicians, uh, seeing to it that uh, congressmen, for example, uh, knew that they owed them a debt of gratitude. Uh, that they could count on them for money for support. So that said, congressmen, if some sort of labor legislation came before, say, the House or the Senate in, in Congress, uh, they would oppose it. They would vote against it uh, because they were counting on that money from, uh, you know, the business owner uh, that gave them support. So they fought through the political arena. Uh, business management fought back in all kinds of nasty ways. They would uh, they would control newspapers. Uh, they would start their own newspapers to put out negative press on labor, uh, you know, make uh, strikes out to be the fault of the workers or, or violence and things like that. Uh, and and in, in talking about violence, you know, they would also uh, hire these people that, that were called strike breakers. These were guys who, like the only thing they were good at in life was beating people up, physical violence and things like that. So these strike, strike breakers, like they would just be sitting at their homes, say in Chicago, uh, they get a call from somebody and say, hey, we're having a there's a, a problem in, say, Homestead, Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a ticket for you waiting at the uh, train station. Yeah, we need you and your guys to get on that train and come out here to Pittsburgh and help us with this strike. What these strike breakers would do is they'd show up. Uh, they dress like uh, just normal people and they would get there, get out there in and amongst the strikers, the workers and sort of listen for information, get details. Uh, you know, sit in on meetings and find out their plans. Uh, but also sometimes these strike breakers would just go into a crowd of people, like a strike situation, and they just run up and hit somebody right in the face and start a fight, you know, start a violent situation breaking out. Uh, then, you know, 
the fight would break out, people would get hurt, trampled, things like that. Uh, then the media would would put in the newspaper, you know, this, you know, these people are so disorganized, they're fighting amongst themselves, uh, you know, they're, they're causing harm to their own cause and things like that. Uh, so yeah, business management just wouldn't cave. And in fact, really the only thing that did change the situation for American workers, uh, ultimately it was the US government. Like you, you have to get into a progressive age. Uh, you have to get into the, the age of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson for the government to start to come around to this fact uh, that we, the people of the United States were being exploited, gouged and taken advantage of. And those business owners were furious when labor legislation got passed. Uh, they vowed revenge, they lawyered up, they said, how dare you tell us what we can and cannot do with our companies. Uh, but then, you know, the United States government would ultimately reply, well, you know, we've given you guys tax breaks, uh, we've given you guys subsidies, uh, we've sat on the sidelines and let you do whatever you want to do. And it's obvious that uh, you're gouging people and you're taking advantage of them. So, uh, yeah, for the good of the country, somebody's got to step in uh, and rein in your excess and what you're doing. So, yeah, these business leaders, they fought, fought, fought. <clears throat> and the only reason they couldn't fight anymore is because the U.S. government passed legislation uh, to help labor and to help those who work in factories. So to summarize this topic, uh, for better or worse, the Industrial Revolution hit. It was here to stay. It wasn't going anywhere. Uh, and this this whole topic was about looking at how factory workers respond to the Industrial Revolution. It absolutely brought about good things, uh, more jobs, better standard of living. No one's denying that. Uh, but there were also the negatives associated with the rise of industry, uh, such as monopolies, which again, uh, you know, killed competition and led to unfair prices, and the exploitation of the American workforce. Uh, with long hours, very low wages, uh, frequent layoffs, uh, unsafe work conditions, you know, people just felt compelled to fight back. Uh, and again, they realized that as individuals, they probably weren't going to change anything. Uh, that, you know, one person is not going to get a, a factory uh, to establish better working conditions. But that maybe if everybody worked at said factory, maybe if 400 people came together and said, hey, enough's enough, uh, then maybe things could change. And that's what leads to the rise of the labor unions, uh, which those organizations are the ones that eventually get things like an eight hour workday minimum wage, uh, safer work conditions and workers' compensation, uh, as well as child labor laws passed. Uh, the next topic that we'll look at, which is populism, will also be a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, uh, but populism is going to be how farmers uh, responded to the Industrial Age. All right, well, uh, you guys take care of yourselves and uh, talk to you soon. Bye.